Okay. So, hi everyone, my name's Paul. I'm the Brain Monitoring Specialist with Medtronic for BIS and Cerebral Oximetry. So what I'm going to do is we're going to talk you through the BIS monitor, what it is, what it does, how it does what it does and how you get the best out of it. Um, so then we'll do a practical session and we'll follow up and we'll answer any questions at the end. So if you save your questions to the end, that's fantastic. So what is BIS? BIS is a dual channel in phase processed EEG monitor that gives you a number between 0 and 100. 0 being no brain activity, high 90s is alert and conversant as we would be. So the reason it's dual channel is that it filters out two channels of higher level artifacts, so things like uh, theatre equipment or ECG, it's trying to filter out or ignore when it processes the data. So we know in terms of the EEG, there are individual frequencies at different dominances present all of the time. So when you're awake, you've got much more beta and alpha in your EEG, and when you're asleep or, or deeply anaesthetized, you've got much more theta and delta. So again, this is partly what BIS is analysing, is the relative strength of the beta component of the EEG. And this is the quick change as you descend from wakefulness through unconsciousness. The other thing that BIS analyzes is the amount of near or actual cortical suppression that's present in the EEG. So when our BIS descends below a certain level, the patient's very deep, we start to get some near or actual isoelectric EEG where there's no brain activity. And these are what we call flat spots or suppression. Some of you may have heard of it as burst suppression. So again, this is analyzed by BIS in part to give you that number. In terms of the actual EEG itself and the way it looks visually, we can see the scale down the right hand side here between abyss of 100 and 0 and the various states of wakefulness and unconsciousness. And then in the middle we can see the visual change in the raw EEG. So when you're awake you've got a very high frequency low amplitude pattern and when you're in the GA range you've got a much more relaxed slower wave frequency and a higher amplitude. And this is about EEG synchronicity. So the EEG itself becomes more synchronous or similar as you descend into that general anaesthesia range, down to the point where at the bottom you've got this almost flat line activity or suppression. So BIS is really there to help you understand what your relative hypnotic level is in a way that your max and your TIVA algorithms, target effect concentrations, can't do. So you're looking directly at the brain and anaesthetic sensitivity or insensitivity, which varies quite significantly per patient. What this can't do is tell you where the patient's awake or asleep. Um, and this is why your expectations need to be set realistically when you're using something like this. What does that mean? Well, what we do know is that below abyss of 60 the chance of awareness is statistically negligible and above abyss of 40 we're avoiding this suppressed activity which in older sicker patients and the latest six RCTs and Cochrane review suggests there's a higher instance of post-op delirium when you run in these deep states in these higher risk patients so you're using bis to titrate what you may find is Sometimes, if you run in the BIS quite deep, for any given surgical stimulus or level of analgesia that you run in, you may find a certain level of volatility in BIS, whereby if the patient's slightly lighter, if there's a surgical stimulus, the BIS is higher, you'll get more volatility in the BIS, just because that patient's uh, less deeply anaesthetized, may need more analgesia, etc. So you'll see that volatility. The difference between what BIS can show you and what you'll sometimes see in relation to movement or hemodynamic changes is very important because you may potentially get a CNS precipitated spinal cord mediated response from surgical stimulus or low analgesia where the patient will move, heart rate or blood pressure could increase, but the BIS may not change.
okay and sometimes you're going to see the best change or creep up and then you'll see those hemodynamic changes as well so this is a better presenter at the target of reactivity in the individual patient than your hemodynamics mm -hmm. alone So essentially this low frequency EEG is interrogated in the 0 to 30 hertz range but the company ran it slightly higher up to 45 hertz and there's a reason for that in terms of BIS's reactivity to spot potential awareness in high risk patients. So there's a gap then between 45 and 70 hertz where nothing is monitored per se and then between 70 and 110 hertz we're measuring or targeting frontalis muscle EMG or higher level EMG activity um, which is a form of electrical noise in that frequency range. The thing you maybe need to bear in mind from what you'll take away today is that where you have a lot of EMG it may not be forehead frown response, it could be diathermy, it could be that you switch the bear hugger on could be because the surgeon's very close to the patient's head. So it's electrical noise in that frequency range, but it isn't forehead frown response. So this is why I talk about analysing all the other parameters on BIS, including the raw EEG and your suppression, and we'll cover that when we go through the practical. So you're really you're thinking about BIS in balance, but where you've got a situation where you've got a lot of EMG, some of that can filter down into that lower range, and the BIS thinks that's beta activity, so your BIS will elevate, okay, but it's a false positive. And that's some of the trade-offs between interpreting this clinically and the BIS reactivity if you get a genuine case of awareness as a safety feature. So although the, the BIS number is dimensionless, it, several studies have shown it correlates very closely with CMRO2 or cerebral metabolism. So you can think of your BIS as an objective guide to how the target or the brain is responding to any given level of hypnotic. So whether you've got an over or an under sensitive patient or a patient in the range that you, you, you ideally want them. The other reason I mention this is because BIS tracks cerebral metabolism, anything that affects cerebral metabolism will affect BIS. So if you have a pyrexial patient where the temperature is elevated, cerebral metabolism is higher, the BIS will be higher. Consequently, if you're cooling the patient, the patient needs less anaesthetic to maintain a certain depth because cerebral metabolism is lower. Where that can also come into effect as well if you're using things like ketamine, which increase cerebral metabolism, you may have an elevated BIS, or um, if you have moderate to severe hypoxia that affects the EEG, it's been well written about that you can see a drop in BIS to zero and that the BIS can then come back when blood pressure is raised above autoregulation and uh, the head's reperfused. So you can see some of these phenomena with BIS as well. So the raw EEG is digitised, it's run through a power spectral analysis of the relative strength of the beta ratio and then the corresponding frequencies of alpha, beta, theta and delta are also analysed in terms of their relative powers to filter into any near or actual suppression to give you the BIS number at the bottom. So BIS is very much a staged algorithm and it's looking at different priorities as you descend through consciousness. Okay, so we'll move on to the practical session now. So, BIS monitor, we're going to run over the BIS monitor. And uh, what I'll ask for now is a volunteer. Can I have a volunteer up? Put the BIS sensor straight off. You'll notice that underneath you have some small green areas. These are what we call the zip reps. And they're small uh, plastic tines that pull apart and then grip the epidermis so we can get good signal quality and impedance. So the BIS sensor can go on either side of the head, depending on patient position. If you know you've got something like carotid stenosis, or you're clamping or shunting on one side, it could be an advantage to put the BIS on that side uh, to spot any changes. So number one in the centre of the forehead with the arrow pointing down the bridge of the nose. Number three on the temple level with the eye. And then the number two, and the number four sit down quite naturally in place. So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure the sensor's well stuck. 
Always clean the skin with an alka swab to degrease. And then we're going to press the blue buttons really quite firmly with your fingertip for two seconds each. So normally, we've put this on before the patient goes to sleep. I always warn them. Uh, it feels like somebody pressing Velcro into the skin. How's that feel? It is quite sharp actually, isn't it? Yeah, it does pinch a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so we just plug the patient interface cable in to the best sensor and we'll see a small sensor check coming up on screen there. So straight away we can see the raw EEG, this is the first thing that comes up and then after a 10 or 15 second lag the BIS number will appear. So again you know it's setting your expectations of what you'll see intraoperatively when you put this on the raw EEG and then the BIS number. So again when you give your induction 10 seconds later the BIS number drops but we probably see a visual change in the EEG much earlier. So intraoperatively the same thing's happening. If the patient is to start rousing, you're going to see the frequency tighten and the amplitude reduce in the EEG before the BIS changes. Okay. So we're going to do a little experiment in just a second. So from our EEG, we've got the BIS number on the left, the signal quality, which is the green bars here, and if we've got more than two green bars, we'll have a BIS number that we can read. The EMG, the immediate EMG here, which we see is the orange bars because he's awake, he's alert, he's got uh, a strong forehead frown response, and then the bis <laughs> trend over time. Okay, right, so what I'm going to ask you to do now is I want you to close your eyes, relax your shoulders, try and screen us out, just concentrate on relaxing, nice, slow, steady, deep breaths, and I'll tell you when to open your eyes. Okay, open your eyes. So your bis dropped down to 88. Bear in mind, you, know, you might fall asleep about 80. Deep sleep, 75, you're in the light to moderate station range. So it's just an interesting example of this corresponding link with cerebral metabolism where if you take away um, cortical activity from the senses, cerebral metabolism drops, the brain's very efficient and it shuts down slightly, so your bis will drop slightly. So when you, you're sat in the coffee room, you've got your eyes shut and you're relaxing, you're probably not far off the natural sleep range maybe. Okay. So a bit of an experiment there to show you around the monitor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just run over the main features of the monitor with you. So always check for damage, wear and tear. Obviously in the housing here, um, in the... This X, which is this section here, this is where all the computation occurs. So we're looking for um, damaged seals and that kind of thing, damaged clips on the back. Get that down to medical physics if you notice that. And obviously if anybody's pulled this or this doesn't connect properly. Um, we are then looking at our various displays which we've looked here. So we've got messages up here if we've got artifacts. Um, the BIS number will disappear if you get less than two signal quality on your index. What we might want to do is change some of the settings, so we'll go over the more common ones there. So in terms of the, the menu, what we might want to do is set a target range or a band to operate in. So in the top left hand button, we press the target range, we can see we can set a low and a high, we can increase or decrease that range, switch it on on the left hand side, on or off and then choose whether we want an alarm or not and always exit the menu by pressing the little home key. So this blue band here is what we're aiming for. If the propofol is going on the floor and the bis rises we'll get an audible alarm. The other thing that we might look at is um, the chart data. So if we look on the right hand side we can see every 15, 10, 5 minutes what the time, what the BIS, what the EMG was, so you can chart that down. We can also look at alarm volume, so just here, we can change what sort of level we want the alarm. And then in relation to any settings that we change, 
we can press view save settings here and just press save active so the next time you switch the BIS monitor on and off it will come back to the same default settings. The other thing you can change is what's displayed in the bottom and top of the monitor. So if we press the menu we can press BIS and EEG and just change the two over. So if you want to read more technically the EEG we can do that. Now as I mentioned before within the EEG it's a digitized EEG so we're looking at frequency and amplitude changes but the more technical among you might want to uh, look for delta waves or delta peaks interspersed with alpha you know if you're reading up on this and uh, you want some more surety what we need to do is turn the filters off so the way we do that if we go back into the menu and click next and then next again filters on, off or on. Okay, so we turn the filters off so we've got the red square and we'll see more readily now what what we're going to see here. So that, that is actually a delta peak but we'll see the waveform of the EEG in a bit more detail there. Okay. Okay, so if we want to check the BIS sensor, we're not sure we've put the BIS sensor on correctly, and press the bottom sensor check button and you can see the corresponding ticks if there are any areas that you need to press a bit more firmly it will show you and then when you're not connected to a patient if we want to download the case this bottom button becomes trend review okay so what we can see here is the individual cases the last 30 cases that we can cycle through and the top right hand button is a little download icon where we can download a PDF. So we just pop a little USB memory stick into the back and we can download any cases that we want to for teaching or to put in the patient notes. Okay, next stuff. Okay, so contraindications, things that we're thinking about. We're always thinking practically about this lagging of this number. So you're looking at the raw EG, you're looking at the EMG, suppression to give you a full impression of where your patient is not just relying on that snapshot of the number. So again high level artifact or muscle tone we're aware of in terms of the fact that it may or may not be clinical sometimes we can get this higher level electrical noise that could be diathermy or it could be environmental it's non-clinical but it could give us a false positive in the BIS so again we're always interpreting that in terms of agents or other contraindicators, anything that affects cerebral metabolism will affect BIS. So if you're using ketamine, there's some uh, indications there to bear in mind that that may elevate the BIS because it increases cerebral metabolism and it produces a different dissociative response in the brain um, that BIS isn't set up to recognise. Beta blockers, anything that affects the patient physiologically, opioids or nitrous that add a bit more analgesic effect, you could find then that your BIS trend is a bit smoother over time than if you run in a lower analgesic profile. Bilateral BIS is important to mention because what we're able to do when we're thinking about BIS as a cortical function monitor is to analyse the left and the right sides of the brain independently. So normally BIS will correlate left and right within a few points of each other. Um, however, if there's more than a 15% difference, it can give us a clinical indication that something's happening to the patient clinically. So it could be um, hypoperfusion, it could be seizure activity in one hemisphere, it could be some other compounding factors. But where you see a white asymmetry in the centre of that DSA view, it tells us that there could be something happening where BIS is diverging from left to right. Okay, so we're going to go through a quick quiz to see what your thoughts are. So we've got a patient that's hemodynamically stable, no movement or response, everything seems fairly standard we might suggest that patient's adequate, we're happy with them, adequately anaesthetised, but the BIS is low. Tell me what you might be thinking in this instance. 
in terms of your management or your thought process. So everything seems to be in the right range hemodynamically, all the signs from the patient, but the BIS is very low. Yeah. What operation are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. So is there something neurological going on that's affecting the BIS outside of depth? Anything else? Temperature. Yeah, absolutely. So in the cardiac cases where you're cooling the patient quite significantly, it's not uncommon to find very low BIS in single figures or even at zero um, because they're so heavily cooled. Okay, so let's have a look. So yeah, consider hypnotic state because what we do know is hemodynamics aren't always a good independent predictor of depth. They are surrogates to give us a clue as to where we might be. Um, or we could consider reducing the analgesic. So if the analgesic is too high but everything else is stable, uh, you could have a depressed BIS because there's just no surgical response whatsoever. So that's just something to get you thinking about what you might look at. So in terms of the evidence, what we do know about BIS according to the meta-analysized evidence is that we can save between 18 and 20 percent um, in our volatile anaesthetics and between 25 and 50 percent in terms of propofol in some of the latest studies. That means that we see significantly less post-op nausea and vomiting, 60 percent reduction, and that we see less time in recovery on average six minutes and potentially three minutes quicker to extubate. In terms of awareness, the Miles and Ekman studies on the left and right you may be aware of and they show a BIS guided anaesthetic compared to um, standard anaesthesia and show significant reductions in awareness in high risk patients. The centre study by Avidan, sometimes referred to as the bag recall study, analyzes patients that had BIS at high risk of awareness and patients that had um, an entitled MAC protocol of between 0.7 and 1.3 MAC and that showed an inconclusive result where neither technique uh, both seemed to reduce awareness to quite low levels. So again it seems to be if you're running a MAC over a certain level your probability of awareness is quite low but what we don't know is how many of those patients were too deep. Again, I use this slide as a talking point because there have been several studies over the years looking at healthy volunteers and at any given range of BIS, how likely they are, are they to respond to a verbal command in red and how likely are they to have explicit awareness in green. So if we take a BIS of 60, which is our statistical cutoff for awareness, we can see that at that level, if we trace the red line across, if you ask the patient to squeeze your hand, repeatedly we can see possibly a 25 to 30 percent chance of response but that they won't remember it okay it's not until the BIS reaches 75 you've got a similar probability of free recall or awareness so again most anaesthetists use BIS quite cautiously and conservatively the mid to high 30s low 40s um, but what this does show us is twofold one that there's a very tenuous link between consciousness and depth of anaesthesia monitors so we need to set our expectations and two all we really know is below 60 we can be as certain as we can be that the patient won't be aware now I mentioned some of the emerging evidence previously and I'm just going to take you over a couple of slides we'll look at the guidance and then we'll answer any questions so one of the studies, one of six RCTs is the CHAN um, study looking at 921 patients from 2013. Now all the patients were over 60, ASA 3 and 4, so higher risk, and had more than two hours of surgery. All the patients were neurocognitively tested pre-op, post-op, and three months after surgery. And they found from that study that you could prevent a cognitive change or negative outcome in one in 
one in ten patients okay so for every thousand elderly patients you could prevent the equivalent of one in ten from having increased rates of post-op delirium or cognitive decline which seem to be a lesser problem in only 20% of those cases. That accumulated in a Cochrane review from May last year which suggested that these six RCTs now provide moderate grade evidence that these higher risk patients over 60 are more prone to post-op delirium at levels of BIS prolonged below 40. Okay, so these are some of the things that are emerging that people are, are more interested in. And this bridges this into more volatile use in some of these sicker and older patients where you can still get great benefits, potentially run quite low max where the BIS is still very low and have a more hemodynamically stable patient that's easier to recover. So in terms of professional guidance, we know NICE suggested in 2012 that we're using TIVA, uh, particularly with a neuromuscular blocking agent, that BIS be considered as an option. And that all equivalent depth of anaesthesia monitors added to the mix in helping you titrate to balance your patient. But that an anaesthetist should be adequately trained in interpreting BIS and uh, applying what they find during the cases. AAGBI a little bit more definitive where you're using TIVA particularly with blocks BIS is recommended and then the latest AOA SAA, SIA guidance from 2018 is suggesting that where EG monitoring is, is recommended where you're using TIVA um, and that where TIVA is administered outside of the theatre that BIS should still be utilised so that opens it up to ICU where you're paralysing or ventilating patients that could be too deep. And then, um, again, an anaesthetist should be familiar with principles of using depth of anaesthesia monitoring. So a couple of quick examples. I talked about the fact earlier that BIS was a hypnotic relative depth monitor, but you can get different cases depending on your overall balance. So this uh, case study is showing two similar patients having the same sort of surgery but with two levels of analgesia so this patient had a high level of alfentanil and we can see at various stimulation points there was very little reaction in BIS but compare that to the patient case where three times less analgesia was used and we can see quite dramatic peaks in BIS at various stimulation points so hopefully you'll never see anything that dramatic, but it raises the point that the lower the BIS, the more stable it, it, it tends to be to maintain the patient rather than running a BIS in the mid to high 50s where you might need more analgesia, you might need to um, look at that overall balance. So sudden drops in BIS, we talked a little about before and uh, it could be a pharmacologic change so you've increased analgesia you've given a muscle relaxant if you had a lot of higher level artifact that could drop the bis lower because it takes that artifact away it could be a paradoxical delta which is a, a phenomenon that occurs occasionally where you'll see a constant delta wave that could give you a low bis and it could be a reduction in surgical stimulus the other thing it could be, which I mentioned earlier, is cerebral hypoperfusion. If you get moderate to severe hypoxia, the bis drops to zero. We can sometimes find that's the case. And then rises in bis, conversely, you know, we could have uh, EMG or artifact, a lot of electrical noise. Again, we're looking at any changes that we've made pharmacologically and assessing whether the surgical stimulation has changed. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much.